The following fan fiction short stories, The Bar at the End of the Universe and The Stranger, are from the continuing adventures of the Doctor from the Alternate Empire Universe series. Narrated by Julian Bain A Bar at the End of the Universe They say there's a feral safe haven out there somewhere, the Corsair said. He took a long drink from his glass and winced as the fluid burned the back of his throat. They say that's where Lady Romana fled after the fall of the Citadel. The doctor didn't say anything. He simply looked at the mirror in front of him. He hadn't expected to find the Corsair here. The Corsair had regenerated since he last saw him, and was now a hulk of a man far beyond seven feet tall, with large, angular shoulders. His Time Lord tattoo was displayed on his right forearm and was tight against a bulging muscle. He had a large beard, trimmed neatly. His hair was long and straight. You realize that stunt you pulled in the Medusa Cascade has got them enraged. The Corsair cupped his hands around his whiskey glass. And by them, I don't mean the Daleks. The Corsair's green eyes looked at the doctor from the mirror. You saved an entire supercluster from a horde of vampires released in that battle near Dronid, but they only see the strategic loss of the Demat gun. It isn't lost, you know, the doctor finally said. He gave the Corsair a sidelong glance. I, of course, have it. A weapon like that shouldn't be in the hands of people running things right now. With that weapon, the Time Lords could finish this war instantly. The Corsair took another long drink. And then what? I know Rassilon. I've dealt with his brand of egoism before, countless times. He won't stop at the Daleks. He won't even stop at the universe. There was a reason he was locked up in that tower by us. He's no better than the Daleks. In some ways, he's even worse. The Daleks, for all their bluster and bombacity, are trivial compared to Rassilon and his new Time Lord Empire. So, what's your plan then, Doctor? The Corsair turned and looked at the Doctor intently. The Doctor was smaller, thinner than the Corsair remembered. He was dressed in a dark blue long coat, a vest with a small fob watch hanging from its side. How long do you think you can hide? I've had to shut down my TARDIS power matrix. They tried to hijack me through the Eye of Harmony. Type 87s have a leaky back door through the Singularity Control software. I told you to downgrade when I last saw you. Plus, the old girl is so jerry-rigged and cross-wired. Even if they tried to get control, the poor bastards would get lost in the internal control matrix. It would take ten technicians to get the first one out, and then they need someone else to get those ten out as well. You think that will stop them? No, I don't, but I'm working on a more permanent solution. He looked up at the Corsair. You said something about a feral safe haven. Tell me about it. There are rumors, the Corsair nodded. After Romana's presidency ended, the Therals pulled out of the military treaty with the Time Lords. They retreated back across the CVE. It's said they've been shuttling people who want to escape into e-space. We could go, you and me. We'll find other Time Lords who believe like we do, believe that this is insanity. We could retreat to e-space help build some kind of Time Lord society. The last I heard, the Time Lords have destroyed all active CVEs. Even if there was a Theral safe haven, there's no way to get there. The Therals are clever kitties. I'm sure they've got some secret spot out there. We just have to go and find it. You are welcome to search, the doctor said, a finger tracing the edges of his glass. There are still things I need to do here. Very important things. If you want, I'll find that granddaughter of yours. Take her with me. What do you say? The Corsair smiled hopefully. No, no. Susan has already made her decision. She is going to help as many people on Earth as possible. She was always braver than people gave her credit for. In some ways, she's braver than I am. She's been on the front lines of this for decades now. While I've struggled out there and did the best I could. Doctor, you were there when it was important. You swooped in and saved the Draconian Collie from that end form. 
That Bandro colonial fleet would have been eradicated in the Battle of Kvatru if you hadn't opened that dimensional warp gate using the hand. I heard you were at the Eye of Orion shuttling people out when the Time Lords and the Daleks started lobbing black holes at each other. They hold parades for you at Carfell, for what you did stopping that Time Lord bombardment of their planet. And for every Kuvatru, every Draconian colony, every Eye of Orion, and every Carfell, there's an Arcadia. He sighed and held his head in his hands. I can still hear them, praying to their gods as the Time Lords detonated that weapon. It was immaterial. The Daleks would have never succeeded there. I had already poisoned that well. They were praying for the Daleks to come and save them from us. I watched the Time Lords slaughter an entire world for no reason other than the fact that the Daleks were there. I watched the Time Lords become monsters. You can't blame yourself. I certainly can. The doctor glared at the Corsair. I had a chance to stop this, because I was there. The wires were in my hands. The doctor lifted his hands and held them in front of his face. You see, I hesitated. I second-guessed myself, and the universe suffers from my decision. The doctor sighed and turned back to the bar, and cupped his hands around his glass. I often think of what would have happened if I had gone through with it. How much different the universe would be. The universe would have been a darker place. The Corsair said quietly, looking down at the Doctor. A universe without the Doctor would not be a universe worth living in. If you had done it, you would have died. No question about it. You are a good man, Doctor. You can't be everywhere, everyone. This war is pervasive to the very core of reality itself. You won't be able to save everyone. And if you came with me, you could shape a brand new era, teach a whole new civilization how to be good. No, the doctor said, shaking his head. For too long my instincts have been to run away. I've fled so much in my life. I fled Gallifrey. I fled my responsibilities as Lord President. Even now, rather than face my demons, I am here at this bar. I have to stay here. I have to stay here and see this through. You will die. Everyone will die, Doctor, the Corsair said, his eyes stern on the shorter man. This war, no one will win. You can't stop it. The doctor lifted his glass. He gulped the drink down and placed the glass back on the bar. Go. Go find this safe haven and get as many people as you can there. And if I survive this, if I live to see the end of this war, I will find you. The doctor took a step back and then started to walk towards the door. So where are you going now? The doctor turned and looked back. I never know until I open the TARDIS door. She takes me where I'm needed. I'm just along for the ride. The doctor pressed on the doors and slid through them, leaving them swinging, as he disappeared onto the fairway. It would not be the last time the doctor saw the Corsair. Many years after, the Corsair heard of the doctor, the stories of heroism, of the stranger that showed up at the most dire hour and saved colonies, saved refugees, saved worlds. The man who disappeared as suddenly as he arrived. The Stranger They were sick and injured. They were men, women, and children. All were smudged with mud, soot, filth, and blood. All were lost. All were caught in the flames of a war they couldn't begin to understand let alone be a party to. They were shuffling as fast as they could, the able helping the disabled, and the strong carrying the weak. Over the next rise was a ship. It was going to take them away. Flames erupted randomly everywhere. The man who saved them from the raid was running up the hill and looked over the ridge. He turned back to the line of people. Everyone, quickly, 
The ship will leave soon. Kor knew the transport vessel wouldn't stay long. They never did. It was too dangerous in these parts, and the window of escape could shut at any moment. He winced and decided to scope the situation himself, running up to the man. Kor winced as he felt his skin pull against his thin frame. Kor's long, thin hair kept falling into his one good eye. Kor clambered up the incline, stepping over the rocks. He had to stop and lean forward, hands on his knees, gasping for breath. He could feel the pain of skin tearing as his lungs burned from the acrid smoke. He heaved himself up to the ridge line and looked down at the hissing vessel sitting in the valley beyond. He bent over and wheezed, slightly dizzy. We need more time. <coughs> Kor coughed. Finally, his chest rattled as he gasped for breath. The scorins won't stay much longer. Things are getting too hot for comfort, said the doctor. His eyes were intent on the vessel below. The ship's already in the first stage of liftoff. Kor, are you okay? Um, I'm fine, Kor said, waving the question off with his right hand. Certainly a lot better than if you hadn't showed up. The Ogrons would have massacred us. All I did was a light show, the doctor said kneeling down and looking in the man's eyes. You need to rest, Kor. There's no time, you said. Well, we'll make time. He looked down at Kor and saw the expanding red stain on his shirt. You've broken your stitches again. You were told not to lift anything. I had to help her over the last rise. She was pregnant, Kor said, wincing as the man pressed the area. Ah! 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 Lay down, the doctor said forcibly pushing Kor onto the ground. I might be able to stop the bleeding. So, so you're a doctor too? Kor laughed and winced as he did. I have some experience with the profession, yes, the doctor said as he rummaged through his satchel. I saw you in the cab, what you did. It was amazing, you know. I've never seen Ogrons run away like that, ever. You had them terrified. The doctor was determined, his eyes searching feverishly in the dark. The doctor growled in frustration as he wasn't finding what he was looking for. He had curly brown hair that played down on his Byron-esque face. I mean, considering who the Ogrons work for, I didn't think anything in the universe would scare them. It's an ancestral response. Even the Ogrons couldn't breed out the fear of their own ancestral gods. The doctor said his hands nearly elbow-deep in the satchel. He suddenly smiled. Ah, there it is. He pulled out a small metal device. He looked at Kor. I'm going to cauterize the wound. This is going to hurt. I need you to hold very still. Do you understand? What? W what is that? Kor said as he looked skeptically at the device. It's a laser lance, the doctor said as he pressed Kor to the ground. Now hold still. Are you insane? Kor shouted as he struggled. The doctor had surprising strength and pressed harder on Kor's shoulder, pinning him down. Look, on the appropriate setting, the lance will not slice, but will simply seal the wound. Now please, we don't have time to do this the proper way, so I'm sorry. Kor heard the buzz and then felt the searing pain as the faint red glow burned into his gut. Kor's body tried to seize and fight and get away, but the doctor held him firmly. Seconds later, the buzz was over. There was no more blood. The doctor leaned down and helped Kor up to his feet. He reached into his satchel and pulled out a small paper sack and held it as an offering to Kor. He smiled encouragingly. Have a jelly, baby. In fact, you can have as many as you want. Kor reached in and pulled out a yellow one. He put it in his mouth. It was sour at first and then sweet. He chewed it and smiled. He reached in and grabbed another one, a red one, and ate it feeling the sugary confection melt into pure bliss. It was erasing the pain. And then he finally opened his eyes. The sky exploded. Not the atmosphere, but the sky beyond. Blinding light erupted. The ground shook. He felt the wind shift. The flames roared loudly. Kor blinked, rubbed his eyes until his vision blurred back into existence. He looked down at the hillside. The refugees were on the ground. They were crying and shouting. The doctor shouted at the sky. No, 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 no! 
The doctor turned to Kor. Go to them. Get them to their feet. Get them moving now. He looked to the sky. The stars were different. They were moving. He looked back to the doctor. What's going on, doctor? What's happening with the sky? It's the time, lords. They detonated the whole cluster with some kind of temporal embolism. The entire quadrant's history is changing as we speak, but not for the better. The doctor looked at Kor. You need to get out of here, now. What are you going to do? I'll slow the ship down. You get all the people there. All right. Kor staggered backward and then ran towards the crowd. They were screaming and crying. The doctor disappeared over the ridge. Kor watched the sky as the changing star started to disappear into the gulf of darkness. He ran. His stomach hurt, but he ignored it and ran. He shouted to the men who were standing and gathered them to get the others on their feet. It took him several minutes to realize that the sirens had fallen silent. Kor started ushering people up the rise and over the ridge. The ship was still there. It was trying to take off. The doctor was pointing something at the ship with both of his hands firmly clenched. It was a small, thin rod. The ship's thrusters flickered, seemed to be struggling. The vessel was definitely trying to take off. As the refugees trickled down the hill towards the ship, Kor ran towards the doctor. Kor shouted as he ran. You've done it. He looked back. The refugees were rushing the ship. The people were shouting for the doors to open. Go. Go now the doctor said between gritted teeth. Tell them I won't release the thrusters until he gets the refugees on board. What about you? Kor asked, looking at the doctor. If I move, the link will break. He gave Kor a sidelong glance. Don't worry, I've got my own way out of here. Who, who are you? The people will want to know who saved them. I am a traveler. I help where I can. I'm nobody special, but you can call me the doctor. Please, trust me. There's nothing you can do here, the doctor said, his arms straining against the rod he was holding. Take care of them, and do your best. But, go. Please, I can't keep this up forever, and we don't have time. Or rather, we don't have the right kind of time. It was an honor to know you, Kor. Kor nodded slowly and turned and ran. He ran to the crowd. The crewman was standing on some scaffold on the ship. Kor took a painful deep breath and bellowed, Hey, you aren't going anywhere until you let us in. The crewman looked down at Kor and then looked at the stern of the vessel. Kor started up to the crewman and shouted, He's got you trapped in a sonic field. He won't let you go until you let us in. The ground erupted under their feet. If you don't let us in, we are all going to die. The crewman lifted his shirt sleeve to his mouth. Something was said and then the cargo doors of the ship opened. The people flooded in. As he looked to the refugees, Kor got caught in the stream of people who pulled him into the ship. The cargo door hissed and slammed shut. Kor turned. He wanted to shout that there was one more person, but he felt the jolt of the ship's thrusters pouring on the power. He felt the vessel jostle against the gravity and then the inertia of the acceleration. Kor! A woman next to him held his shoulder, we would have never made it without you. No, not me, said Kor quietly. It was that stranger. He saved me and us. He stopped the ship. He bought us time. Who was he? asked the woman, searching Gore's face. I don't know for sure, but he calls himself the doctor.